Hello, Yes But Why listeners. This is your host, Amy Jordan. Welcome to Yes But Why, episode 237. My conversation with comedian Ivy Meehan. But first, a bit about our sponsors. This episode of Yes But Why podcast is sponsored by Audible. You can get your free audiobook download and your 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash yes but why. Audible is available for your iPhone, Android, or Kindle. Download your free audiobook today at audibletrial.com forward slash yes but why. This episode of Yes But Why is also sponsored by podcastcadet.com. Podcast Cadet is dedicated to helping you build your podcast. We will connect you to the resources you'll need to get better and better with each and every episode. Swing on by podcastcadet.com to get help for all your podcasting needs. Let us know you heard about us from Yes But Why, and you'll get 20% off the workshop or service you buy. This week on Yes But Why, we talk to actress and podcaster Ivy Meehan. Ivy and I talk about wanting to be performers, but how fear can really hold you back. Ivy tells me about every job she had that was theater adjacent before she finally bit the bullet and became an actor. Support Ivy now by watching her film A Room Full of Nothing, available now on Amazon. You can also check out her podcast Local that features conversations with small business owners. I now present to you, and I swear the name makes more sense after you hear her stories, <laughs> Yes But Why, episode 237, Retired DJ Ivy Meehan wows film festivals across the country. <laughs> Enjoy! I'm Amy Jordan, and this is Yes But Why Podcast. Yeah. I mean, just hit me with a bang. I, it, it goes back to one of my grandmothers that lived in the same town that uh, my family lived in. We, it was a big family and she every year would have orchestrated and like written and created costumes for a little like Christmas pageant every year when we, our family got together for Christmas. And so, you know, one year it was like reading a Christmas book and one year it was like reading a biblical story and one year it was singing different songs and you know, it was, it was always something different and creative and um, was the earliest memory that I have of like performing in front of somebody, which I realize is not the question, but I would have to like seriously say that that's the first time that I remember feeling this is what, this is such a cool feeling to be telling a story and people are like, I mean, not that I like that people were watching me, but they were watching the character I was playing, even though I was playing like a shepherd and had zero lines. But like that feeling of telling a story, I really remember it back then, which was, you know, from the time when I was a toddler um, through like probably middle school. Um, and I had cousins older and younger than I, and they would always, you know, they would, the older ones would get the the bigger parts. But I feel like I, I felt something then that was about storytelling and that's, that's what ultimately I think then at, led me to ask my parents to, um, if I could join like, you know, the community theater that did a musical every summer. And that was like the big thing that went on in our town during the summer. And so you would go to rehearsals for two months and then do the performance. I don't know who came to those performances though, because everybody in the town was in the show. And so um, that, that was the earliest though, was like I said, Christmas pageants in my grandparents, like living room. I love that your grandmother put all that together. I mean, like that in my mind is exactly like she was meant to be making theater and she didn't. So she found her way to make it happen with this Christmas pageant that she put together. Like the idea of yeah. making the costumes and giving you guys roles and being like, okay, now perform it. Like, right. That, that's like and what I do even, like, for my life, like you know? <laughs> <laughs> right. And now that I'm thinking about it, I don't even think that she, I don't think she like made the costumes. I mean, she was a lovely woman and probably could have made them, 
but like I think we just like used costumes from her church. Now that I'm thinking about it, I think that's actually what happened. Who so, like, cares, in man? My she mind... sourced the costumes. She of gave course, you of course. something to wear, man. Does, just because like, she can't sew she... doesn't mean she didn't put that show together, no, man. No, no, no. <laughs> right, exactly. But also, like, it now that I'm thinking about, like, she she was like the magic of it all. Mm-hmm. Like, showed me what the magic of theater was. And I wouldn't. I now I I don't think before I would have said that she was like very into performance or very into you know, theater and things like that. Um, it, it, but she must have been. I mean, she it must have been like a hidden talent. But yeah, she I mean, kind she of... she was. She did it. Explored this. She yeah. did do it. I mean, listen, I don't know if it was award-worthy, but like... Oh, no, that's not the point. point guess, the point so. is like people have it inherently in them, you know what I mean, to want to do these kinds of things. It comes out in lots of right. different ways and lot, for lots of different people. Some people become sure. politicians. Some people become real estate agents. Some people just really like giving speeches. And so they do like TED Talks and stuff. Everybody mm-hmm, performs mm-hmm. in lots of different ways, right? So right. it's just like yeah. this is Everybody how it came to. out. And then clearly, you know, your genetic makeup of uh, her, you know, was was so theatrical. It it uh, infused you. <laughs> that remind my I have uh, tw- twin three year, three year olds, and they're obsessed <laughs> with The Greatest Showman right now. Yeah, and there's a line that one of the characters says that's like, "Oh, what's your act?" Because I don't know if people know it. But basically, it's like asking somebody what their act is because they're going to maybe join this circus. And, and the guy's like, oh, I don't have an act. And she's like, everybody has an act. And it's like such a sassy, you know, throw to him. And it's so true that like everybody performs every day of their life. I mean, even if you're a parent, you're still doing some form of performing in front of your kids daily. Um, and yeah, it just like manifests itself in different, in different ways. And that was her way. You're right. Yeah. I mean, most people, I would say that a large portion of people would not consider themselves a performer, but that doesn't mean that's not what they're doing. Any person who is a salesperson is a performer. Oh God. And like, and if you're a good salesperson, like, yeah, you're, you're a good performer. (laughs) That's hard work. Yeah. So tell me more about what you said you ended up doing plays at the community theater. Did you like continue that through high school? Was there like a program for you to do stuff in? How did it manifest for you later as you got older? Um, no, I did not. It did not man. It did not carry over. I guess I did that for a few years with like my entire family, our younger sister and parents and the whole community. Um, but we only did that for a few years. And then I got really into sports. And I mean, I was into sports before that, but like then summers turned into, you know, a traveling softball team or a traveling basketball team or whatever. And so my, our summers were just like completely overtaken with sports. So I guess like I was probably trying to do the math, but like probably middle school, Um, I stopped doing those and kind of just really threw myself into mainly golf was what I like threw my time into. Mm. And I, I liked being a part of a team because I liked being a part of an ensemble, um, you know, being on stage. And so I think that's what, I think being a part of sports has also helped me in, in my acting career because it's such a, I mean, having, doing a movie or putting on a play, as you know, is like such a team (laughs) driven you know activity um and so i've learned a lot on in the different sports teams that i've been on that have helped me you know later in life but yeah i kind of stopped performing i guess but i also never really feel like i got started it was like this is just kind of the family thing that we did and then i wanted to be in middle school I, i here's the other thing i always secretly wanted to be an actress Hmm. actor whatever we're gonna call it but like i never felt a good enough or b like it was a serious enough venture mm. no, and not for by any stretch of imagination for my parents like they have always 100% been supportive and like excited about whatever endeavor that that i would you know choose to to tackle but i think i just was very in, influenced as a kid and was very much like well that's not accessing emotions and things like that like I felt like actors did even at a young age 
was just not like the cool thing to do as a teenager. And so I think I, I think I was like very, um, you know, sh like kind of put those feelings away and didn't really want to access them because I thought it was kind of, um, I, don't, I thought it was kind of, it was showing weakness or anything like that. Like I really bought into the whole, you know, like uh, as a middle schooler, what you're supposed to like and what you're not supposed to like. Did I like the Spice Girls? No. But did everybody like the Spice Girls? So I like the Spice Girls? Yes. Mm. And so now looking back, I'm like, well, that kind of sucks that I was that I had that attitude. And it was, you know, it was just like the sense of, you know, wanting companionship, wanting friendship, wanting to be liked. And then there was a certain point. Uh, well, there were certain times in middle school. I remember, for instance, like the school was doing Annie. And I was like, God, I want to be an orphan so badly. But I just didn't have the like confidence to audition. I, I was scared and I was petrified to audition. So I thought, well, I want to be involved somehow. So I asked to be like a stage manager or in tech or something like that. And then at the last minute, somebody dropped out of the play. And so I had to go on and do the role of the dog catcher, which I don't know if anybody knows, but there is a role for the dog catcher. No lines. It's literally just like a walk on holding like a net. A fishing net is what I believe we used. And so once again, I felt like thrust up on stage. And and that was the first time I remember really being like, this is something that I really want to do, even though it's like the smallest role. But I like felt, you know, ownership over it and like remember being like, here's my backstory. Didn't know it was called a backstory at the time, but like I I was also a male dog catcher. Like that was outrageous of me to think of as like a 12 year old that you know there wouldn't be women dog catchers but I like did that whole process with my brain and as as the dog catcher I mean I still did tech the rest of the you know rest of the play I didn't leave my techies and then <laughs> that kind then I stayed but I stayed doing sports I didn't I didn't I literally I'm trying to think back but I did not get on a stage again until later in high school, probably like my junior year of high school. So that was seventh grade, seventh or eighth grade year. And then, and then I didn't get on again because again, I just like felt like I was going to be made fun of, hated auditioning, was too scared to like sing in front of people. Yeah. Um, I would say these are like very valid was... like fears. You know what I mean? Like you're right. Sure, I was a theater sure. kid in high school. We were very uncool, you know, like, we were not hanging out. See, I don't know, but like looking back, I'm like, no, no, no. Those kids were very cool. Like those kids. I was one of those kids in high school, but like, that's not, I mean, I get it. I understand what you're trying to say, but it's also like, we, like, why did it have to be like, I was, it was as if I think because I watched the movie can't hardly wait, like way too early in my life. <laughs> it's all about a, a, like high school graduation party with like, sexual undertones not even undertones overtones mm -hmm. and like drinking and drugs and I probably watched that like way too early in life and just thought that those you know cl clicks and cliches of high school like that's what you know was supposed to happen but some of my best friends are from the theater world from like high school theater you're so, so funny even though they're my best theater, friends so are in the theater world it's okay you were a jock <laughs> it's fine it's fine embrace your jock time some of us no. never got it i didn't do sports i did track for three <laughs> seconds and the coach was like please stick with it and i was like bye and then i like went away like three so. seconds is really fast i mean <laughs> yeah i ran the full six miles in three seconds and i was like listen guys <laughs> I don't need to I be with song. you guys, okay? <laughs> yeah, right. I was more like, I was like, That's wait, funny. we're running? And they're like, the name of this event is running. And I'm like, cool, I'm not <laughs> into that. Oh, what a boring event. Yeah, running. Running. So what are I we going to do? We're just going to run? What do you mean? Long yeah, distances. I, I don't get it. I Why? still don't get it. Well, my I mean, husband went to Cornell and ran track and, and like long distances. And I'm like, why, why would you do that? And then I say, I went to school. I, I went to uh, college on a golf scholarship. And he's like, why would you play this awful game that makes me so angry? And I'm like, cause you ran around in a field for like hours. What makes we him angry about kids. golf? Just the people that play it. I assume not the actual <laughs> game. It's a very regular no, game. 
it's a very frustrating game though like if if you're sure. competitive which he and i both are <laughs> it can be a very frustrating game oh, i see yeah yeah i figure i just a, lose a hardcore shot. yeah well but see i bet you're competitive in other worlds sure sure but yeah like golf isn't problem. my thing <laughs> <laughs> so that's why i'm like i don't I'd just be like, hey, guys, I'll ride in the cart. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I have a cute outfit. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah, Look yeah. at you. You did it. Yeah. Four. <laughs> I get it. Okay. It's when fun. this is all over, we're going to go play a round of golf. <laughs> I think I, it's fantastic. We went over to Barton Creek Country Club to talk to a friend of ours the other day, and they told us that mm -hmm. the golf has not slowed down not one bit during COVID, that they were busy the entire time, that everybody else went on furlough, but the golf guys were hardcore full time. <laughs> Well, but I mean, it kind of makes, well, I don't know, we sure. live in Texas, so I guess there's something political about that, but it also is like, no, if no. you can you're social, outside. like, I could go yeah. out on a, right, you're outside, you can socially distance, uh, you literally don't have to come into contact, like, you, it's a sport, you shouldn't come into contact with other people, <laughs> um, and you use your own equipment, so, yeah, yeah, I mean, it makes sense. It's we kind could, of the okay, perfect you uh, just, thing. You just set yourself up to play golf way sooner than anticipated. <laughs> oh, because now, now I know where to go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's totally safe. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm going with a golf pro. Oh, boy. It's going to be crazy. <laughs> oh what about what about golf did you love? Like, what's the what's the allure of golf? Well, here's this is I think you just kind of became my therapist because <laughs> you <laughs> Well, hear me out because I think, I think what I loved most about golf was nobody else played it. And so it gave me a sense of uniqueness that I think mm -hmm. a lot of theater kids feel like, I hope that, I mean, I see that now, like, oh my gosh, did you watch Encore on Disney? <laughs> I did not. Uh, okay. It, it like, it's like a show where like Kristen Bell goes back and goes back to other high schools and they bring back all these kids that did, you know, Beauty and the Beast or uh, any, any show that you would do in high, Grease that you would do in high school. And they cast everybody in the, basically in the same roles and they do the, they do a performance again, like 20 years later. It's fantastic. Anyway, but it, it's that kind of sense of like, um, a, a sense of ownership of I am doing something that literally was the only girl in our high school that in middle school that played. And it wasn't like a look at me, look at me kind of thing. It was like, this is just my unique thing that, that kind of sets me apart from other people. And I always wanted that to be performing. I wanted to, that to be my thing, but I, I never had the confidence to like, like I said, auditioning was terrifying, and and I thought it wasn't cool. Not that golf is cool either, I guess. Now that I think about it, um, but it's but it was that thing of like, it's something very different. I just wanted I wanted so badly to be different, but wasn't will weren't wasn't I wasn't willing to put myself out there in the theater world like I wish I could. Plus, there's just a lot of, like, self-deprecation that can come with being a golfer because everything is on you. And so, like, there's no blaming. There's no teammates that can bail you out. Like, it's – if you mess up, it's all on you. And I've always been – you know, it's like a little self-sabotage, I think. Wow. I don't know. You're my therapist. Maybe you can help me. <laughs> you can help me figure that out. I feel like uh, all the people I've ever heard refer to those kinds of things uh, are referring to doing stand-up. They're alone. If they bomb, it's their own problem. Mm -hmm. They have mm -hmm. to deal with mm -hmm. it. I don't know. Maybe you should be a stand-up. Just saying. Who knows? I don't know. I need to take one of your classes before I go. I would love to write stand-up, but I, I... – <laughs> Don't have I the don't confidence know. to do yeah, it. The writing of, I feel like the performance of it, I would love to do. Like I would <sighs> love, would have loved to have been cast as Mrs. Maisel in the Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Oh, but yeah. like, it's so like performing somebody else's stand up lights my fire, but having to write it myself makes me want to hide under my bed. Sure. Maybe sure. one day. Yeah. So who knows? So that 
based on this, what you just said makes me want to hide under my bed, makes me think of your, Mm -hmm. you've talked a few times about how it was terrifying, this idea of doing this and auditioning, but like, you got over that hump. How did you get there? What happened? Like, did somebody smack you in the face and say, you've got to do this? Like, you know, was Olympia uh-huh. Dukakis available to smack you? I mean, <laughs> oh my God, I wish I would pay money. Um, she would accept the uh, that's, money. That's an interesting question. I, I don't, I, I don't think that anybody smacked me physically and honestly, not even verbally. I, I remember vividly between my junior and senior year of high school. Um, I remember turning to my parents and saying, I, think I want to take a theater class and they're like okay sure yeah great let's sign you up for theater class in in during school but because I hadn't taken any classes up until that like until I was a senior they couldn't put me in like theater 101 because that was with freshmen and eighth graders and I was like 17 almost 18 and and like I had done some forms of you know theater in my past and ironically an ironic twist of fate the high school theater teacher was the same woman who directed a few of the community productions like 10 years prior. And so she knew us, you know, meaning my family, I knew her obviously. And it was a little bit of like strings pulled of like, we'll bring you up into the senior level class. And, but you have to do this kind of like this, this amount of work, which was obviously I mean, theater work is so rich, like, you know, there's no books or anything like that, but it was a lot of like reading certain plays and, and writing summaries and things like that and writing my opinions about them. But it was like, she was the one that like pulled me up into the ranks of the theater department. And I don't know why, (laughs) like, I I honestly don't know why. I don't remember if there was an audition. I don't think there was, because I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have gotten over that that quickly, but I think it was just her believing in me enough, at least in my work ethic enough to join this production class that was all seniors that had all been in productions for four years, multiple productions a year, had directed things. I think it was her confidence in bringing me up to that level. And, um, and, and then, and then throughout that year, I did a couple of like variety shows. You had to do a senior project in that class. And so a couple friends that I made in that, in that particular department, we did like a variety show. And actually we talked about parodies before we got on the podcast, but like we were writing (laughs) parodies to Broadway shows and like somehow weaving in an hour long show, weaving in like wicked songs and hairspray songs and Phantom of the Opera songs and like making a story out of it. (laughs) And so it was just that was like one of the projects we had to do for as a senior project and like i think that she giving she just gave me the confidence in my senior year which was a crazy year i was like trying to figure out if i was gonna where i was gonna go to college where i could play golf to go you know get a golf scholarship moving away from home for the first time so like every all of the anxieties of senior year but all i remember from that year amy was like being with the theater troupe that's not true. Like in case my like basketball girls are listening or something like that. I, I it had a wonderful year on golf team, basketball team and softball team. But my greatest memories are like singing in the car, singing show tunes in the car or like doing our one act production where I was cast as the lead, which is insane. I was cast as the lead. And then the guy who was cast opposite of me dropped out within the first week. I don't know if it was related to me being cast opposite him but he dropped out so we had to change the one act play that we had chosen to do for competition and I ended up getting a role that had like three or four lines again there are no small parts and um I just had a blast with this crew and then we go and we go to performance go to competition we're doing this performance literally one time we get one shot at this and if we advance then we get to do it again we did not advance side note and we kind of knew we weren't going to advance We get to the competition, do the performance. It's my, it's coming up on my cue line to walk out on stage. And I like, I'm like a witch or something dragging my foot and like carrying a fake baby or I forget what the role is, but that's what I remember. Classic. And they they missed my cue. The, 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 the cast missed my cue. And so my scene got skipped 
Oh. So I never got, I never got to do my performance. I mean, it was, again, it was only three lines, but like, that's all I was there for was to do those three lines. And it was like pivotal to the show. <laughs> what was said in my scene so I never got to do it but like looking and I was devastated but like looking back it was such a funny anecdotal like thing that we now even now reminisce on um but so that's a very long answer to answer your question but it's like I think my <laughs> theater teacher Sheila Lucas is what was um, her name confidence in me Sheila Lucas Sheila Lucas I have since done other things with her she's she's legit I mean she's uh as you are one of those like you know I don't think that it's teachers or those who can't do teach I think those who can teach teach and also do because I don't think that like as an actor most people can't just jump in a classroom or jump on a you know virtual teaching I think that's amazing what you all do and along with your performances that you are that you that you also do but she She's, uh, you know, it's like she's SAG. She's done a bunch of, you know, commercials and and films and um, and things like that. And so it was, it's been great to like lean on her throughout the last what 15 years, 10 or 15 years. And it does, it com- it all comes back to her letting me into that senior <laughs> production class <laughs> and giving, and then casting me. We had three shows a year: a children's show, a one act, and a musical. I couldn't do the musical because it interfered with golf. And the other two, she cast me in lead roles, which is like absolutely ridiculous and probably should not have happened, but it did. And it gave me the confidence then to, to you know, kind of keep trying the stage out as I got into college. So you went to a school where you got a golf scholarship, probably because they recognized like you did that it made you quite unique. Um, but you got involved with that, but I saw, did you get a degree in theater as well? No. In fact, this, the school that I got the scholarship for is a, is a business school. Like there wasn't a theater oh. department. There wasn't a, a theater auditorium. Um, there was no, there was no arts at all at this school, <laughs> which I probably should have like looked at before I went. But like as a student athlete, I knew my time was going to be, you know, sucked away and trying to maintain academics and then also trying to, you know, earn my scholarship. But I, again, like the self-deprecating self-sabotaging me was like, I don't deserve to be here. I am not as good as these other girls. I'm obviously now the small fish in the big pond. And, uh, and so I was just, it was like, you know, petrifying, just like, it had been for, you know, auditioning during high school and middle school. Yeah. Sounds like an unusual crowd to hang out with in college, you know, just to well, be I super my... focused on golf yeah. and I don't know, sort of let yeah, that but, theatrical I mean, even... behind. It, and I, and I did for about five seconds, but again, it's almost like I found, I found, I, I found my different groups of friends, my, the, the, my freshman year and sophomore year golf teams, we still get together. Like those are some of my best girlfriends and um, you know, all of our kid we all had kids at the same time. It was like almost like a weird cyclical thing that we all, we all lived in Texas. I mean, the, the school is in Dallas, but um, we've all stayed in contact and gotten together every year since, hmm. but I also lived on, none of them lived on campus. I lived on campus my first two years. And then my second two years, I was, uh, I lived on campus again, but I was an RA, a resident assistant. And so living on campus gave me a little bit more of a, like that college, you know, college life feel, meaning I'm, I'm stuck on campus and I can't go anywhere because of golf anyway. So it's like, not, I'm not going to parties. Um, so it wasn't that kind of college life. It was more of like getting involved with different committees and, <laughs> you know, trying to find friends that way. And I did, I mean, it was, even though it was a business school and there was absolutely zero artistic, <laughs> any kind of artistic, you know, group on campus, um it was there were there were people that there that were musical that were singers that were they didn't know maybe but they were they were actors and performers and like you talked about you know that every everyone is a performer in their own way and it was I mean I kind of take pride in that that first fall semester especially two of my closest friends that also lived on campus we formed a theater troupe and so we would start 
um, we would do variety shows like we had done in my senior class production where we would write parodies and we would, and then it just became like kind of a, a variety hour show of doing, you know, SNL skits. And there were some amazing singers that would sing like big time ballads and top 40 songs and musical numbers. And we would like learn one big dance number. Um, but we, <laughs> I mean, the, the campus was beautiful, but they didn't have an auditorium or a stage. They had like a, a small chapel and it was not a private university, but they had this like old, old timey chapel that had been donated to the, to the uh, campus. And so we would do our performances there because it was the closest resemblance of a theater, an auditorium. It was like, you know, 10 p wooden pews and then a pulpit. And like, we would stand near where the pulpit would be. And actually within a year, because these shows became so successful, uh, and we ended up getting, they hired a, an artistic crea creative director. Uh, and he, from that, that spring on, we had a spring musical every year. They've had one every year since. And so it was like, we took a lot of pride and I still do take a lot of pride in like starting something on a campus that had literally zero arts. Um, I mean, the closest thing we had to an art form was like they would bring a hypnotist on campus on like <laughs> homecoming week. Yep. And like that was the and I was always the first like raise my hand and get hypnotized. But we would do, you know, we would do shows <laughs> every couple of months. And it got me not only I mean, my degrees in entertainment, sport, promotion, management. That's a mouthful. But it, it I used a lot from that degree to market the shows and promote the shows to the you know nearby high schools and we ended up doing one of them at a nearby high school at, they have a huge cedar hill high school has a huge brilliant um like state-of-the-art auditorium and we got to perform with some high schoolers and so you know it was i think it was it ended up being like a really cool outreach avenue for the school that they didn't have before that um and we you know we 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 never made any kind of money or anything like that for the school probably, but um, actually that's not true. I feel like the musicals as we went along, you know, we, we did something like we did Godspell and it was always like smaller musicals that you could do in a tiny black box theater, which is what we imagined that this, that this tiny chapel was, but we did like Godspell and Charlie Brown and I love you. You're perfect. Now change. We almost did little shop of horrors, but I think it got late. We like couldn't get the funds together something anyway. So <laughs> that really became the time in my life where I was like, oh, you can just make your own art. <laughs> yeah. Like you, like people, people will come, people will watch. Um, you know, we had all, all walks of life as, as one does at a, a at a university, and it was also an international university. So we had kids from like all different countries around the world that would come to these shows and be so supportive. And I I kind of lost that feeling of like, I need to not it not scratch this itch, the performer itch. I, I need to scratch that. I, yeah. I, I felt like I'd been that for so long. And I, here I didn't have to, because again, when you go to, when you go to college, like you can be whomever you want to be. I mean, you can literally be a different person, which I don't know if that's a good piece of advice or not, but it's like, <laughs> I, nobody knew me. Nobody knew me other than the girl with the golf scholarship, maybe, but I feel like a lot of people didn't even really know that. And so I could be that theater arts girl or that, you know, like broad, I had like Broadway posters all over my, you know, my dorm room. And I ended up my my roommate who was in like a girl group pre like in high school she had been in like a legitimate touring three like th like a destiny's child style girl group oh. and she has the most beautiful voice she sang at my wedding and she never knew that she liked acting and performing that kind of music and she went on then to do other things after the fact because i think she really like found a, ni a niche right there with, with the like theater, you know, the theater kid that is in all of us. You just have to kind of scratch that itch. Your variety shows make me think of your grandmother's Christmas pageants. They're very similar. Mm, they were. Mm. They were. Yeah. I it's, mean, actually, uh, it's now, lovely. You, you can... Lovely. <laughs> 
If you compare them though, I feel like my grandmothers were probably a little more put together. <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to say that we were ever like intoxicated doing those shows, but like we might've been. Yeah, sure. I'm sure. You there's were. a good chance. Yeah. There's a good chance that we were. Yeah. yeah. College. Yeah. There's like no supervision. I mean, it was literally just like, no. Hey, security officer, we're going to put on a show this Friday. Can you unlock the chapel for us? And he would, and we would go in. Oh, I know what I was going to say. It's like after a year of these shows, the school rounded up, uh, they, they got a creative director and then they rounded up enough money to buy like legitimate theater lights that were <laughs> the size of like theater lights you see in any theater around town. But because it was the, a tiny, tiny room, they were so hot. <laughs> And so I'm sure there were multiple like fires that were about to to happen, but oh, yeah. you know they had no idea. I've been what so to buy, many of those. And they installed yeah. these, they installed these like giant lights. Yeah. But then we really felt like we hit the big time. Yeah. So we had to up our game with you know costumes and things like that. And sunglasses yeah. for the audience. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, because uh... it was like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 It was really bright. <laughs> I know so many theaters that have just like they've upgraded and they just get these bigger theater and bigger uh, light lighting instruments. And you're like, that's we don't need that. But no, right. we could have spent the money on right. something else. Why didn't you ask us? Why like, didn't you ask us? Like, why don't we get a curtain that doesn't have a big hole in it? I don't know. <laughs> or like the yeah. door creaks yeah. when people open it. We have to enter <laughs> into yeah. it silently so that, you know, from the outside to do an entrance. That's not good. Right. Right. You know. Instead, they just blast you with the sun. Yeah. Or or no, ours was like uh, we had a theater in the round and the entrances were, you know, blocked from the light, but they would go like ee! So it was like, well, there goes, by the way, there's a guy coming in a second. Like <laughs> nobody could sneak up if you, you'd have to like right. literally block it so that they came out of a different area because it was like, don't make them go through the door. You'll never, there's no element of surprise. Don't be suspicious. Don't be suspicious. You could have gotten somebody in the audience like, okay, at this point, start coughing so that it deflects from the noise oh of the door. Oh my God. Can you imagine? Can you imagine arranging <laughs> coughing? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So tell me about so now you're you're a successful actress who's been in many movies <laughs> and I, I wanna mean, know uh, you know, how did you do that? Like what happened after college? What like made you move forward? You mentioned earlier that you lived in New York. I didn't know you lived in New York. How did all how did that all play? Well, there's a theme here that again, I wanted to after college move to New York or LA mm -hmm. but couldn't for the life of me use the um I knew I didn't think people would take it seriously that I wanted to go and be an actress like I didn't I just didn't think that the entertainment world like I thought you need I, so what I anyway so what I I don't know what I thought at the time but as a junior I, I did an internship in New York because again I'm like I'm gonna get to New York somehow maybe this, maybe I need to get there. Like people will take it seriously if I'm there for a job, like an actual, you know, I say actual job, like a, like a nine to five job or a job that helps me with my degree, like my internship. You and... don't have to apologize for the culture's distaste <laughs> for our career. We all know it. Anyone who's going to listen to this podcast will know it. We all live in it That's every true. day. Usually when I'm right, talking like... to people, I'm trying to pinpoint where that comes from for them. But realistically, <laughs> it's pervasive. I mean, it's it's in everything. Right. I, I was know. talking to somebody just the other day and they were like, how do I write a real person resume? And I was like, you have a real person <laughs> resume. Like, like, yeah. you know, yeah. we, we put ourselves down <laughs> as if we don't exist because they act like we shouldn't. But if, if COVID has taught us anything, it's that we couldn't last a damn day without 14 to 600 <laughs> artists keeping us entertained. Thank you. Like, I come know, on. that's I I literally have my resume as primary and secondary. And you're right. The secondary one is my acting resume. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not <laughs> Even secondary. Even though I probably made more money that way. Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I, it's okay. I, so you, yeah. I'm just, I'm just releasing you of the, uh, of you okay, having to feel like well, you have I to also, apologize for this idea that you thought because all of us think it. I so know. it's, it's okay. I know. <laughs> but I, yeah. So there's that theme of like, I want to do something, but I don't have the guts to do it. And sure. looking back, I wish I just had the guts to, well, everything happens for a reason, I guess. And, okay. and my path has brought me here. And so I'm fine with it. But like, I do wish I'd had more guts to say like, you know what? No, I'm going to get my degree that has nothing to do with entertainment and I'm going to go to New York and I'm going to figure it out. Like that was, that was the movie that was, I thought I was writing and it did not play out that way. Um, So I, I, I went to New York to do this internship and for what kind of company it was, it was, well, here's the other thing is like, I was like, I have to be in the theater. So I'm going to get a theater internship. So I got a theater marketing internship Uh in Times Square with a great company. I mean, I got to see tons of shows and not because they gave tickets, but because I would like go and sit in, you know, student ticket lines for hours before I would go into work. And then I'd go see Legally Blonde like 15 times during this internship. What year was this, Um, if you don't mind me asking? This was 2007. Awesome. 2007. I believe I, 2007 was when I moved away from New York City. So I just wondered if we were there at the same time. Do you ever think about like how many times you've crossed paths with somebody and then later in life you meet them? Oh, I mean, (laughs) there is a, there's a finite amount of theater people like legitimately. And once you start making connections, like in a larger scale, it's crazy how everyone just knows each other. Like even when you Mm -hmm. and I met on a room full of nothing and Mm -hmm. I sort of knew Elena and Duncan, I had heard of them for years before I um, ever saw them in person. I'd heard their names Mm -hmm. with relation to Austin Mm -hmm. film for many years beforehand. So it was like, and then, and then all of a sudden I get this gig and they're like, Hey, you can do, you can go and meet these people and do this. I was like, what? Okay, great. You know, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, We're always yeah. crossing each other's paths. We're always right around each other, right? right. As far as You're I'm right. concerned, right. every person you pass, you should treat them like next week they're going to be the lead in the next NBC like movie. You I know what it. I mean? Like where it's like yeah. where it's like every anyone you know, so many. Plus I've worked in theater since ever. Like like I got mm-hmm. a theater degree. I've been doing theater forever. There are people mm-hmm. who I worked with along the way who are currently famous. You know what I mean? Where it's right. like, right. yeah, I did a play. Nobody knew who she was then, but now she's famous, right? And it's right. like crazy, yeah. crazy. Like to yeah. tell stories where you're like, so then I'm talking to so-and-so and they're like, really? And I was like, this was <laughs> way drop. years ago, right? Uh-huh. Uh, I try never to tell name drop stories, but I can't help it. I got like six. I got to go for them, right? Well, and you worked with them, so it's like that's the that's that's his life. Yeah, it's I not like reading... I saw them in an elevator. It was like no, for six right. months we worked on a play together. We spent time <laughs> right. together. Right. At one right. point, we she knew my together. name. Like I don't think if we saw each other again, she'd be like, "Amy, <laughs> oh my god, I've missed you." But like you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, she might, she might, whoever she is. Oh, I was god. thinking too. Like I think about sometimes when there, I see a fly, and I'm like, "Have we met before?" Like. Have we been in the same? Are you the same fly? You are going down that, one like, crazy existential me. rabbit hole Dude, for know. sure. That's insane. Um, Wait, no, don't try to change the subject. I want to know more about. You went to New York City. You got a theater marketing yeah. internship. Did you feel like you were part of the theater scene? Did it further invigorate your need to become a theater full timer? Hell no. Well, well, well I, to, to answer your for first question, did I feel like a, a part of the theater scene? No. In hindsight, I 100% was. I mean, I don't know if your listeners know many like Broadway names. We're just talking about name dropping. But like, basically, if you look at the Broadway uh, and off Broadway, like list of shows that was taking that was going on during 2007, 2008, whoever those leads were, I was like, driving them around Manhattan to like different Barnes and Nobles to do different, like, you know, set up uh, a, a signing for like playbills or getting them to sing a song. Like I was like their handler. So in that sense, yes, I had amazing conversations with these like legitimate, still awesome, super famous in the Broadway world 
actors. And I was, I was like just a sponge trying to take that all in. But that was still when it was like, you know, there's a point of like, there's a, there's a, there's a part of an actor, like you want to make enough money to get to the next gig. You want to, you don't want to be famous to be famous. You want to be famous so that you can, you can work, continue to work. And it was like still in that phase. It was less about the storytelling is what I, where I've eventually become. But yeah, I felt in that sense, yes, I was definitely in the, the, the Broadway specifically theater world, but I was not in any shape or form, like ready to take the plunge to then go out there and like figure it out myself. I mean, I, I, I went to, everyone asked like, while I was there, I don't even know how long my internship, I mean, it was less than a year. It was, it was like, I went to one audition the entire time that I was there. And you know what happened? It was an open call, first of all, which is like, whatever, in New York, there's a dime a dozen of them every Saturday. It was an open call at a, the W Hotel in Times Square. And I stood in line. I had my notebook with the song that I had never sung on a piano with a piano before. And I got so nervous and anxious. I pretend to get a phone call on my phone. And I walked out of line and I never looked back. I ne So the whole time I was in New York, I never went to an audition fully. I mean, I stood in line for one and then I walked out. Mm. So I wasn't like immersing myself trying to, you know, get an agent or trying to uh, like see what that world was about. I was just going to the theater a lot. I mean, I would go to the theater like three or four times a week and pay $20 a ticket, which I didn't have. I mean, I was still a college student. But like, that's where I spent my stipend was, was from the internship was going to see theater. And so that just made me, that made me want to perform. I don't know if that made me want to go to New York. I was pretty miserable the whole time I was there, mainly because I was like 19 years, years old, maybe 20. So I couldn't go out. I, I knew one person there who was actually in like an off Broadway show and was a vocal coach. I did take some vocal lessons from him. But like, I knew nobody else. And so it wasn't a great experience looking back. I mean, it wasn't a great experience in the moment, but looking back, there was so much to learn and so much that I did, I did learn during that time. New York is a and tough place. And I also place. dyed my hair blonde. So, oh my oh. gosh, it's, <laughs> well, I, I, it's a longer story, but like I lived in Spanish Harlem and I, I wanted to dye my hair blonde forever. And I walked this, is a, I like walked into a, a place, I spoke minimal Spanish and point, so I pointed to a, I, again, I'm living in Spanish Harlem and there's like, I pointed to a swatch of blonde and was like, I want to be this, this is the color hair I want. I think that the hairdresser put that number on my brown hair, dark brown hair. And so when I left, I had bright orange hair, like she did not. They did not, we, there was something lost in translation. She didn't bleach your first. my hair to be blonde. No, 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 no. Yeah, I think we just got that. Yeah. So I came back to Texas and, and to like finish out my last two years and, and was like so enthralled in just being on any stage possible, which again was like our pulpit at, our, at the chapel. And that, but I will say, I thought maybe theater and especially musical theater is not for me because it's so cutthroat and it's so, I had taken no, I, I had taken piano when I was in elementary school, but like other than that, I didn't know how to sing. I didn't know, you know, people that are, people that are really in musical theater have trained for years. At least that's the story I'm telling myself at the time. Ivy, you're and killing so me. Then, you're killing me. Come on. It's, <laughs> well, it, that, that was the moment though, that it's made me switch to like, you know what? Maybe it's not New York, maybe it's LA and TV and film. And so I ended up meeting, I think my English teacher, one of my last two years of, of college got me in, she has a friend, she was on the board of some, you know, the board of some theater in downtown Dallas. And on that same board was also an acting coach for TV film acting. And I met her. So, so this English teacher introduced me to her because she knew I was an actress on, on our campus. And so I started taking some like on camera workshops. And that was my first step into, you know, not having like a cartoon face. So that took a, that took a good two years before I got out of school that like, 
I was going to those probably paying more than I should have for these like workshops where they would bring, he, she would bring down like Jason Alexander or Jason Wood, who's like a casting director from LA, like bring down these different big name people who I thought I needed to learn from, for, at least to like learn, you know, TV, film acting and what the difference was. And, and, and we did a lot of like, um, uh, you know, auditioning skills and things like that. I was also part of an improv troupe that, that well, technically it was a DJ company. So it's Wait, are you true. a DJ? Friends. I, I, I was, I'm retired, <laughs> but I would do like hot mitzvahs and like, I did like two weddings and cried at both of them. And so I never did another one again because it's the biggest day of a woman's life. And there's no reason that 18 year old Ivy should have ever been in charge of leading that day. And, but the best ones were like Christmas oh, parties or, so you know, funny. 4th of July barbecues. Like that's, that's when I learned more about production and like, you know, setting up sound equipment and thing like things like that. And actually performing as myself or performing in a different way that's not on stage really and not you know on tv and film but that dj company also had like a corporate uh a, a corporate gaming kind of um team building department so we did a little bit of that and then we also had this improv troupe that we would get hired you know to do different shows at different corporate events and uh, and community events. And then we had like a murder mystery. Troupe. It's all the same, like four or five of us, by the way, I, I make it sound like there's different departments and like everybody has their, their role. Like it was the same four or five people DJing, improving, doing murder mystery and doing team building all in one weekend. So that's where, that was like my, that was my job during my second two years, or my last two years of college was a way to perform every weekend in some, in some form um, and then also to make money to get to take, you know, some, some, some film classes, <laughs> man, I, it's a that weird is time. super I mean, intense look, that you spent yeah, all that I, time like, at the end of your college career working for this event company. I mean, it really feels like you were just dying to do this and every, every chance yeah. you could, you were, you were doing it. So, so listen, man, we're, we've been talking for a while. There's a lot of you talking about how you don't do it, but I have seen your IMDP page and you have done <laughs> quite a few things. Uh, so tell me what happened. What broke it? What happened? What was the first thing? What was the audition that you made it to? What was the like sh first show that you got into? How did we get to where we are right now? Well, I don't know. None of that stuff's like fun. For, it's like not fun to think about. I mean, I, I would say <laughs> the pain's I'm better to think about. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And that's why we're actors. We're you know we're entertainers. I mean, he, here's what I would say: is that I, two years out of school, I was working at a theater, a, a Dallas Summer Musicals, as as like in their PR department, and I was miserable. And I wasn't performing and I was hardly taking any more classes and I broke up. Well, my boyfriend at the time broke up with me and I needed, I like literally probably in hindsight, like needed to just get away from the area, not like physically, you know, but I just like needed, I needed a new, I, it was time to move away from Dallas. And so Been there. I'm thinking, do I literally go to LA? Do I literally go to New York? Well, my family's down here close to Austin, an hour south. And one day I was driving through Austin from my home in Seguin, uh, where my parents are from in Seguin, back up to my home in Dallas, like after Christmas or something. And I'm driving through Austin and I thought, this is where I'm, I'm going to move here. And literally within six months, I had moved to Austin. And my thinking at the time was, I'm going to move here. I'm going to move to Austin there's a great independent film scene here. That was what I told people. I'm moving to Austin to jump into the independent film scene. There's a lot of commercial work in Dallas, but from my minimal experience, like I didn't know what the hell I was talking about, but that's what I thought is like independent film, Austin, improv, Austin. And, and I'll be closer to my family. So that's great. Um, and, and so I, within six months, I found a, a girl that I had done a couple shows with. She and I moved, she wanted to be an actress too. She and I moved, you know, down to L, down to Austin and within six months. And it was like, you, I just had to make the decision to do it. And then we did, you know what? I'm even thinking it was like more like three or four months we moved. 
Um, and, and within, I would say a year, I, I thought I had to get a restaurant job. Like I just thought that's what you have to do to be an actress. Sure. Uh, so Another I got Another misconception I got provided by culture. Totally. I mean, in the time that I was a waitress, I had, I think zero auditions, but what Austin brought me was it, it, within a year, I got an agent and the only reason, and I can say this because this is what the agent told me was the only reason I got her was because she laughed out loud reading my cover letter. And she said, everybody just writes these plain, boring cover letters, trying to be professional and your cover letter you know, grab me for whatever reason. I wish I could go back in time and like, or find it on my, you know, previous computer um, and, and, and master that art again, because I do think there's something to that. But that's probably why I never got jobs out of college because I was writing like goofy personal <laughs> or personality driven cover letters. And of course it would get me an agent. And at the, at the time she, she signed me. I was also, because of Austin, the RTF department at, at, at UT was having a bunch of like, you know, I mean, like as they do every year, like their RTF department has auditions, seems like every day, not now, but um, I would go on boards and just try to find student film auditions. And I probably went to 20 or 30 student film auditions on the UT campus, not have, I literally didn't, I got signed with an agent not having anything except for theater on my resume. And so I knew I needed to get some at least some kind of credits even if we're student films and in the meantime i needed to get better at auditioning and so being in austin gave me the opportunity to have this great yes theater but also tv and uh and, and film department that i could kind of work on the craft a little bit and so i would do student films and i mean you know, i never want to see them because i'm sure they're god awful not because of them or any you know just everyone's learning on those sets so it showed me, you know, what it's like to work with younger people, older people, different uh, experience levels, what it means to be the different, you know, a grip and a, a gaffer and the DP and all these different things that I had no clue about coming from the theater world. And I think those were the the couple of years that I like grew the most because I, I wasn't folk, I was focused on just learning things, not on really becoming a better actor. And I got a couple like commercials with the with that agent, and uh, and then after a few years, I, I well actually one of the student films we did I did with Elena, um, and she she and I were both cast in this probably awful student film, and we just bonded on set. We were only on day on set once together. I think one day we found out we were Spurs fans. We found out we both had family that lived in Seguin, Texas. And so we kind of stayed in contact through Facebook, thank God for Facebook back then. And she, we kind of stayed in contact over the next few years. And that's when she did, um, I, I, I fell off the radar probably with, with film in general, definitely with theater, uh, because it wasn't going anywhere. I was like getting rejected from auditions with my, with my agent. I wasn't, I was so tired doing student films that, you know, it's like you're on set for literally 16 or 18 hours a day and it's like totally illegal probably. But, you know, I was kind of past that point and needing something different and exciting. And she reached out to me a few years later and, and was writing this web series with her, with her friend Mallory. And they had kind of written a part that they wanted me to read, you know, the whole 10 part series for and um, and then I, I just immediately like signed on the dotted line and was like, yes, I want to do this. It was just it was a web a ten part web series. They were going to do maybe a couple seasons, and uh, I I think that's really what kind of pushed things back into the world for me. I'd really shut things out and was not in a good place as far as a performer um, goes. I I just had shut down. And so she and, and her friend Mallory really brought me out of that. And we had such a great time. That was the, the series ended up being called A-Town. Mm -hmm. we, we shot two seasons of that. They brought me into the writer's room and I kind of found this little family, film family here in Austin. And I've done so many other projects with different people on that from that from that particular project. So it really became about, again, going back to like, oh, there's no theater department at our college. Great. We'll create our own. Oh, there's no work for 
you know, 20 something females in Austin, great, we'll write our own web series. And that kind of attitude, I think, not, it's not, I don't mean it to sound like we're better than the auditions that there just wasn't, we weren't going out for auditions. And they had this no, great you story have to, to tell. You have to do your own right, thing. Right. It's implausible. Yeah. I've talked to a thousand yeah. people and they're, it's like, you cannot wait for someone to come to you. It's like dating. No one's coming to you. Yeah. You got to yeah. go out and get it. And you know what? You got to kiss yeah. a bunch of frogs before yeah. you get that prince. You know what I mean? You got to go right. to a bunch of terrible That's auditions right. and learn a thousand things yeah. before you get a show that really makes you feel good. So yeah, it makes a total sense. And then you sense. go back to kissing all those frogs too. Like it's not like it just stops. Like <laughs> you can get the prince and then you go back to kissing frogs forever. So, oh, well, that's true. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, get into kissing frogs. Really... It's pretty all right. Well, that's true. I mean, again, it's like right now, you know what my favorite, I mean, other than obviously like getting to be on set with friends and and telling a really unique story or diving into a character is obviously like one of the most fun things, but one of now, I think one of my most, like the fun thing that I get to do is audition. Like I love auditioning now. I'm terrible at it still probably, <laughs> but just based off of, you know, ratios, but it's like, I really love the idea and it's so cliche, but it's the idea of like, you get to embody this character for 10 minutes and do what you would do with this character and don't do what you think they want you to do, or maybe incorporate a little bit of what you think they want you to do, but you get to do this character for 10 minutes. You may never get to be with this character again. So if you're going to take a few hours out of your week to prepare for an audition, at least go into the audition when now it's all virtual. So like, you know, earn yourself tape or whatever you're doing, it, 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 have fun with it because that's your only 10 minutes that you can get with it for the most part. I mean, obviously, you, you know, yeah, you get, you get to kiss the prince once in a while, but for the most part, a lot of those frogs, you got to make the most of it. Yeah. Plus, you know, if we're going to maintain this metaphor realistically, like, you know, the frogs are a good time, have a nice time. Don't hate them for just being frogs. And, you know, sometimes right. the princes are princes, but they're not that princely. You know what I mean? Right, I've had plenty of gigs right. where I'm like, this is excellent and very lucrative, but it was not fun or it was dumb. Right. Where you're like, right. who's buying this product, you know, or whatever, yeah. Yeah. you know, that yeah. kind of thing. But you're like, I don't care. Paycheck clears. Doesn't matter. Right. Like, right. you know, so, but you still get to do it's the things wrong. that you want to do. It's just sometimes right. it's weird. Yeah. Right. So sometimes the princes are the frogs and they're still princes, but they're also still frogs. Whoa, we I just really got intense with frogs, this. Right? We got yeah, really intense know, into we're this down metaphor. A, we're down a lily pad hole. Terrible metaphor hole of what's <laughs> happening right now. Hopefully they've <laughs> stuck with us. We're sticking with it. We're doing it. So it seems like you're very positive about it now. You've been deeply empowered. You found your squad yeah. here in Austin, and now you're and then doing a lot me. of stuff. Yeah. Well, they did move to L.A. There's not. <laughs> you're not alone. You know, you still get your family. No, 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 no. There's some people yeah, around and, and lot, you know, right. A lot of the, the core group from that, from that series that, I mean, that's the same core group that did a room full of nothing, which is the reason why you and I met. So, yeah. you know, it's, yeah, it's all, it's all cyclical and um, yeah, you gotta, you gotta kind of find your tribe and that you feel comfortable enough being silly with. And uh, I mean, I, I, I did want to say, it kind of feels like there's at some point, it's happened a couple times in my life. And one was getting the guts to say, I want to do theater arts my senior year when nobody, I had never even brought theater arts before. That was like a gutsy moment for me. And it, I probably didn't sleep for two nights before I told my parents and told my you know counselor that. And then there's other times in life that it's like, I like going to the audition in New York. I did get the guts to go there and, you know, curl my hair or whatever. And so I try to like lean into those moments and say like, but you have been, confident at, at times and you have wanted to play golf because it made you feel different and it, it made you stick out a little bit without being obnoxious hopefully and and so leaning into those moments now and as you know as you get older just everything becomes perspective it's like if we're gonna you know we have this amount of time on on, on in in life on this earth why not try to do the things that make you feel fulfilled and make you happy i mean I know we can't, uh, you know, personally, like having kids, having a family, I can't just up and move to New York right now. I can't just up and move to L.A. 
I, but I'll still audition for anything that's filming in LA or filming in New York. I'll still, you know, try to get those jobs. Um, you know what though? We it, talked it, about it just, this idea of COVID and I feel like New York and LA are just not going to be the thing anymore. Like, I just don't think it's the not. Thing. I know. Like, I know. like number one, New York is like a war zone of insanity. Don't go there. And right. LA is on fire. So it's like, we need to find somewhere in the middle, maybe near some water to do this. Like, I know you're like New York and LA, both near water, but it's like, uh, you know, (laughs) but at the same time, it's like, if it's not on fire and it's not like a war zone, maybe that's the spot. I mean, even if it's like Omaha, Nebraska or like, you know, St. Louis, Missouri, hey man, wherever it is, it is. For a while it was New Mexico, right? Yeah. That was starting to become the thing. Oh, and then Atlanta. Poor Atlanta. Uh I don't think Atlanta's coming back, unfortunately. I heard I heard that really really that COVID really rocked that pretty hard. Really? But don't you think it's kind of everywhere now? I mean, like it can be everywhere. I I think I mean obviously things are gonna have to change like with protocols and and restrictions and things like that when with COVID related, but after all of this, if anything, it showed us how it it's helped me become a better self tape auditioner. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, or better self tape interview, like if I had a job interview. So, you know, like you're right. It's like, it's not all about LA and New York. It's, but at the time, as I'm growing up and I'm thinking, this is where you have to go to do these things. Oh, yeah. You know, that's just, that's like, I think we get stuck in those like fairy tales a little bit. And, and again, like we talked about before this podcast, even that there's so many different paths to get to it whatever it is Mm -hmm. you know and like for instance how did I start off as a little you know like flower pot munchkin kid or whatever in Wizard of Oz growing up as a 10 year old then lead me to a DJ in college (laughs) then lead me to an internship in New York then lead me to in a movie that's like you can go and buy if you would like to on like iTunes and Amazon and you know all these other like there's that and then also I do uh like radio broadcasting for high school football teams and right? so it's like like and it's all those are performance aspect all mm-hmm. those give me great joy and so the path to get to wherever it is it's just, first of all, not straight. It's not even crooked. It goes winding backwards and, you know, in loop-de-loops. But there's just so many aspects of being a performer and that have then led me to doing ultimately what I want to do, which is being a storyteller. And so that's, that's I think, that's like the takeaway when I'm, you know, retro, retroactively looking back. You've done this for me. <laughs> you Again, the, the therapist. Amy, the therapist. Well, you know, the benefit of doing an interview like this, and I find it with pretty much all of my guests, is that people rarely reflect on the breadth of their career unless somebody asks them to. Yeah. And so I just try to lead everybody down a path to consider the touchstones on their own path, and then they often notice uh, patterns or or moments where it's like, I've known that I wanted to do this since I was a child. Like I didn't even know I wanted to know it until just now, you know, these kinds of things. Like, yeah. But unless you're legitimately paying attention to your own pathway. One thing I like to say to people mm-hmm. a lot of times, um, you know, as general advice is if you don't know what you're doing as an adult, reflect on what you wanted to do as a kid. And I don't mean like being a fireman. Yeah. I mean, be a yeah. fireman. If you want to be a fireman, they probably need your help. But At the same time, like things like, what did you really do? What was your thing? What were you involved in? What did you like? What did everyone, if you asked your family, like, what Mm -hmm. would they say that you did? Right? Like little stories. What stories do they tell about you? What's the character of the personality that you were as a child? Because that is you in essence. That's you Mm -hmm. in the beginning stages. And then when you get older, all the rest of real life packs down on top of it, starting with, like you said, middle school and the point when someone says, I don't know if you've heard of what cool and not cool is, but you're (laughs) not cool. And you're like, wait, I didn't even know. 
Like, yeah, you sounded <laughs> just like like the the bitchy middle schooler that like you know threw a slushy at me or something. Yeah, it's real. You sounded just like her. That's right. Her voice is in yeah, my head, so not because I was her, but because I heard her. Mm-hmm. I switched to private school in high school <laughs> because of that. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, you have to just let uh, do the journey that you're meant to do and if you don't know what you're meant to do try to see what you've been doing right so that's how right that's how I do it I don't I don't consider myself a, a therapist clearly not I have zero doctor I uh, mean... credentials of any kind um I definitely have a theater degree <laughs> but <laughs> Um, but part of my like interviewing style over the years that I've developed is really just about like looking at what you've done. And in my mind, I hope to lead every one of my guests to examine whatever they do next. And hopefully our conversation leads them to be inspired to do whatever it is that they're meant to do next, because I've sort of helped them see what they really want. At the end of the day, it's just yeah. being like, here's a mirror. Do you see it? Right. Just you take know. a look. Open your eyes. Even one eye. Yeah. There's <laughs> just in your in your spiel, it made me think of, I mean, I'm obsessed and always have been with Carol Burnett. And oh. she, she, I mean, she's got a lot of one-liners, but there's one that's more of a cliche that's just always... I've kind of just, I've, it's always poked up in my life. And it's something like when you have a dream, you've got to just grab it and never let go. And that is to me, what you're saying is that like, you know, when, when, when you, when you look back in time, did you ever, did you ever let go? Which we've talked about already tonight. Like there were times that I had to let something, that I had to let this, this dream of being a performer go. And the other times that it's just like jumped right into my lap. Um, so that came to mind. And then the other thing that always comes to mind, which is like a thing that is, well, the quote is never let the fear of striking out get in your way. And that was always something I feel like my dad must have told me growing up. And because of like any kind of sports pun or quote, just like hit me in the right spot. <laughs> and that, and, and it was that I needed, I needed to hear that. I think about it every time I audition. I remember thinking about it every time I audition, even when I was petrified to audition, because if you, if you let that fear overtake you, like it did it for me in New York, then you're never even going to get up to bat. So it's like, if you live by that fear, what are, what you're never going to, you're never going to get the, the chance to do what you really were intended to do, or you're never even going to go down that path to get to the point of whatever it is because you let the fear dictate it, which I did for a long time. I mean, still do probably on some levels. Yeah, it's hard. I think the problem is that we think there's going to be a moment where the fear goes away, where we think Mm -hmm. that at some point in our lives, we're going to be like, you know what? I'm good. I get it. (laughs) You know, but I don't think that that's actually how it works. I mean, I, I just feel like you have to ride the ebbs and the flows, you know, sometimes you're in it and sometimes you're not. We've all had times where it's like, like I've spent a long time not doing any performance, right? Because I'm home Mm -hmm. with the baby. You know, Mm I, I am doing, I consider this my performance, but it's, you know, it's as real as anything is. It's not like I'm truly performing and, um, And, you know, also teaching is a kind of performance, but um, that's just sort of how, like we were talking about, you know, everyone uses it in a different way. That's how I perform now. Like I perform as a teacher, right? Because I have to get them into it, especially the younger age groups. Um, Mm -hmm, Nah, mm -hmm. I don't want to lie. Every age group, adult, (laughs) children, they need to be convinced to do stuff. So I'm always like, what's up? It's going to be great. Who's excited? (laughs) Any age group, whether you're eight or you're 80, I'm in front of you going like, Mm -hmm. what's up? We're going to do it. It's going to be so fun. I can see what your hands are doing right now. I I mean, even though I can't, I can actually feel your hands hands with that voice yeah oh my god you really wait can i ask you a question about that sure because so i think that this interviewing in itself is a performance yeah you said it's like the most realist of the like i feel like there's kind of two sections of performance and one is where we're more performing like ourselves 
like in an interview or in the classroom maybe. And then there's another that's like what I view the most like cartoonistic, which is not, that's not, that's not really fair, but like being on stage or being in a costume or, you know, personifying a different person. Like, do you have a preference or do you see them in two different, you see performance in different categories? I don't see them in categories such that one's like better than the other necessarily, but I just think that there's different ways to tell stories. And I think that honestly, interviewing is, is multiple skills, right? So interviewing involves I mean, yes, I have to perform. Um, my husband's constantly reminding me that people aren't necessarily listening to this episode, that listening to the podcast for uh, the guests. They're listening to it for me. And every time mm-hmm. I'm like, what? No. Side note, like, come 100% on. 100% of listeners are listening to you for this. Nobody is here for me. And that's totally fine. Right. I'm here for that. Right. But like the idea of that is insane to me. But I get it because <laughs> I'm just... I'm essentially putting out the same vibe all the time, right? My vibe is consistent, but it's because I go into every interview with the same sort of supportive idea. Some people I know, like you and I know each other from the world. We've met each other in person and spent time. A lot of people that I talk to are strangers who I might never ever meet, Mm -hmm. right? So Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have to get deep into their um, stories without them knowing me. And so I have to get them to trust me and I do different things to do that. So like with you, I have held myself back from telling too many of my own stories, but only just because we know each other. And so I can tell you those stories anytime. And and probably because I talk way too much. No, it's an interview about you. It's an but interview I, about you. I know, but I have... I'm trying to get you mm. to tell me things, right? The only <laughs> reason why I ever tell a story is to tell, get someone to tell me one back, right? Ah, like that's the purpose. The trick, the trade, yeah, I think, right? But that's the trick of the trade of like my whole life, right? Mm-hmm, I also mm-hmm. like you have to be able to recognize your own personal strengths, like things that you can do that it turns out is unusual and you're probably the only person that can do it, right? We all have one or two of these skills. Maybe you know what it is, maybe you don't, but you are, I do not. you do have a thing that you are good at that like helps keep you going, right? And one of mine, something that has totally buoyed my entire life is that mm-hmm. people always think, I, rem- I always visually remind them of someone they know everyone all the time Ooh. always right even my voice my voice sounds like someone you've you've met it has a general nasally midwestern feel i'm from boston okay. i don't know why i sound midwestern but it's what it is right <laughs> they've been telling me it since i was a child okay but people are so people are comfortable with me people strangers yeah. off the street they i'm their aunt lucy So they talk to me. People meet me and they're like every audition I've ever been in. They go, Mm -hmm. hey, you know, you remind me, you know, were you in that uh, dog food commercial? And I'm like, "Uh, no, it wasn't me, but uh, I'm here right now and you love me. Or or like, how have we... uh, how you seem so familiar uh, how would i know you i was like when you were imagining who to audit, who to get in this role it was me yeah, 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 uh, yeah and yeah, i yeah, always yeah. do that i when always you... do that and i know that that's cheesy why not who cares but then they're right i i i make them feel funny and I, I, it's a funnier way than going no we haven't met right right like, and also okay it's a memorable experience and right. a way to you for you to stick out yeah right Right. Because you've because you've 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 found a way to tap into that uniqueness and that, you know, I don't know, there's a word we've got to come. It's like a gym or something that's that's unique to you. You've figured out a way to tap into it to catapult you into the into whatever it is that you're doing, into the conversation, into the interview, into the audition realistically yeah, cool. it helps me with everything i'm at the grocery store i'm i'm at the bank people just they smile at me in a way that is not like a stranger smile always so mm-hmm. so i mm-hmm. just i used to be like weirded out by it 
Um, but yeah. now, but now I'm embracing it, especially after I turned 40, I was all like, whatever, let's go. When, did, when, <laughs> when did you figure that out? Like, cause now, you know, I'm going to like be up all night trying to figure out what mine is. You don't have to be up all night. I you have two twins that are going to wake up very early. You need to go to sleep. Think about it for oh, days like, afterwards in the middle of the day. <laughs> when your brain but is why is it that I'm like, I want your, I want your thing to be the, that you can tell me what my thing is. Because I feel like then I start to go too introspective and I'm like, no, you just, you know what my thing is? My thing is that I don't, I'm okay, like, I'm okay with, with being, with looking kind of goofy and silly. That's not a thing, is it? I don't know. It could be. Now, Realistically, now I don't know you well enough to answer this question. Like, we have okay. met in person, but I don't know you well enough. I would ask your husband. Like, okay. like have this conversation with your husband because he's probably the person or, or if not your husband, which I understand, maybe he's not the person that knows you best, finds the person who does and say like, hey, mm -hmm. what do you think if I had a superpower, like re legitimately right now of the things yeah. that I can do, what would it be? And they'll have something. They'll know something. I could I could bring him in here. He could probably answer it on the spot. <laughs> no, no, no. We're not going to involve him okay. in the interview. Okay, what we're okay, going good. to do now, though, is we are going to say adios because we have talked for a long time and you're lovely and you've given such good you advice overall. Them. Usually I ask about advice, but there's been like so much advice all the way through. And I feel like Just there's be a DJ, been... That's all. Yeah, being a DJ. You know, Patton Oswald was a DJ. His Twitter profile says retired DJ on it. So when you said retired DJ, it made me laugh. Ooh. Um, you guys are Maybe besties. You're like bio. the same. Um, We're basically twins, yeah. Pretty much. It's uh, exactly the same, your careers. <laughs> um, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, I feel like you've, you've, put yourself out there and, and told me these stories and, and been so honest about the hard times and holding yourself back and the, the fact that you didn't think that you could do it. And I just wanted to remind you that you did, that even though a lot of the stories, in fact, when I tried to get a positive story out of you, you're like, no, nah, it's way more fun for me to tell you how I was scared. <laughs> and I'm like, that's cool, but really... <laughs> what I need is for you to realize that you don't need to be scared anymore because you did it and you can continue to do it. And also, even currently in the post-COVID film world, whatever that might mean, you know, the skills that you developed previous might be exactly what is required for you know, the next few years of film. You're talking about how, you know, where you live might not be a thing. I think that's totally right. I mean, why not do self-tape across the country and then just get somebody to come do your film? If you've got money to make a film, who cares where you are? Right. Find whoever's right. cool that wants to be in it. If somebody's like, my friend lives in, you know, St. Louis, can she audition? Great, send it in. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then maybe yeah, she's right. amazing. And you don't know. There's diamonds in the rough all over the place. And not a lot of people have the support of their friends and their family, nor do they have a major yeah. city that has a film scene available for them to go to. So I'm hoping mm -hmm. that the world sort of opens up and we can be making stuff all over the place. 100%. I, I mean, it's like the whole like Justin Bieber was like on YouTube, like doing the drums. Sure. And like Usher, Usher saw him on YouTube. I mean, this is, you know, 20 years ago or 15 years ago, I guess. But it's like that. Maybe that's, you know, we had the Internet boom. We had like social media boom, which we're still in. Maybe you're right that there is this like post COVID boom of in the entertainment industry of incorporating different styles and mediums and, you know, personnel. Yeah. Well, you know what else? You know what else? If I were a, Tell me. if I were a TV executive or a film producer right now, or even a Broadway producer, because they're looking for stuff to do, I would be scouring mm -hmm. things like TikTok and YouTube for the best made at home things. Because what you're yeah. looking for always is somebody who can do it without you. So it's like, exactly. so it's like, 
there's so much because that everyone had so much time for a while. I feel like there's less time now, but for a while we were all at home. Yeah. And so everybody was like really churning. The churners were churning. A lot of us were sitting under blankets going like, when will it end? And yeah, that's fine. And that's, that's all right. I was, I was there, but thumb. both yeah. of us also had toddlers with us. So it makes it a little cuter underneath the blankets. Fair. Um, very fair. <laughs> But I'm just saying, like, (laughs) if you were to look out and see who's making stuff and who's, like, actually creating things and putting stuff out and maybe even having high quality end results, I mean, that's when we'd get the next movie. I mean, if if there's so many, there's, there's in the next, like, season of movies coming out, movies haven't been Mm -hmm. made. There's the handful of movies and there's more than a handful, of course, but like movies that are, have been in production where the guys who are and girls who have been editing it were just working from home instead of working in the studios, wherever. Sure. Those will come out, Mm -hmm. but there will be a moment where it's like, well, we didn't make anything for six months. So, so that's when they go to film festivals because that's done. Right. Mm -hmm. They go there. Mm -hmm. That's the new movies because that stuff, you know, needs to be promoted and has already been made and is good. So why not get her done? Right. Right. All the winners of every festival for the past three years. Great. They're the new HBO lineup. Right. Exactly. Exactly. You're right. You know, why not? It's out there. And if you look for it and one assumes that they will begin looking for it. I mean, all of us were in, yeah, they have to, all of us were in quarantine together, agents and, at, and executives, this, you right. know, TV executives, the same, they were also online watching stuff just the same as everyone, you know? So, yeah, I don't know. I think the well, future it, it, is bright and open and possibilities 100%. are there and I'm looking forward to all the fun projects that you are going to work on and you know maybe maybe i'll convince you to let me work on stuff who knows we're gonna have a good time convince me you don't i don't need any convincing let's just do it <laughs> whatever it is i don't even know what is it let's i just don't know out what it is yeah well first we gotta know, figure out what too. your special ability is that's what it'll be i know I'm, it'll be a documentary I, of us trying to that. find it right <laughs> well we already have talked about two very good like documentary style you know, shows tonight. So I feel like that's our contribution to the world. Yes. Good. You're you're welcome. Oh my God. Thank you, Ivy, for being on the podcast. It has been a total pleasure. It it has been for me as well. Thank you. (laughs) Thanks for listening to Yes But Why podcast. Check out all our episodes on yesbutwhypodcast.com or check out all the content on our network, HC Universal, at hcuniversalnetwork.com. 